Excuse me. Is this yours? Oh, yes, thank you. I'm sure I'll find it. Let's say half an hour. Thank you. Yes. Oh, won't you come in, please? Thank you. You did get here quickly, didn't you? Uh, the room's upstairs, of course, so if you wouldn't mind following me, please. Two gentlemen phoned just after you did, Mr. Fuller, but you were the first, of course, and I did like your voice. Well, here we are. Suddenly turned quite warm. I'm sure our climate's changing. They say it's due to the. Uh... You're not from this town, evidently. No. Our last visitor came from Manchester. He was an engineer. What work do you do, Mr. Fuller? Well, I'm an accountant. Oh, come here to work, no doubt. Yes. Oh, that's the blue boy by Gainsborough, you know. I know. I've always been very fond of that picture. You like it, don't you, Mr. Fuller? Because if not, I can... Oh, no, it's it. just that... Uh, well, my mother was fond of it, too. Oh, then you'll feel quite at home. I'll just show the bathroom. Oh, don't bother. I'm more than happy with the room. Oh, I'm so pleased. I'll leave my suitcase and unpack it later. I have an appointment at noon at town. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, I won't keep you. I did want you to meet Mr. Cartwright. Arnold. Yes, my dear. Oh, Mr. Fuller, my husband. Very pleased to meet you. How do you do? He's taking the room, Arnold. Isn't that nice? Oh, yes, indeed. Have a cup of tea with us, Mr. Fuller. Oh, no, Mr. Fuller can't stay for tea. About me, though. You'll be having breakfast with us, of course. Well, if it's not too much trouble. Oh, no, not at all. And supper any evening. If you'll just let me know in the morning. This evening, perhaps. Well, I'm afraid not. I'm meeting someone on business. Well, if you'll excuse me now. Uh, oh. Here's your key. Oh, thank you. And you mustn't ever feel you're disturbing us, no matter how late you come in. Thank you very much. Where are you from, Mr. Fuller? London. Uh, no, I, I meant you're not English. Uh, no, but I've lived here a long time now. Ever been in this part of the country before? No, why? Face seemed familiar, that's all. Oh, rather absurd, Arnold. We're keeping, Mr. Fuller. Yes, sorry, I am must run. We'll see you later. Yes. He's nice. Clive Enterprises. Good morning. Yes, one moment, please. Mr. Mel, Mr. Saunders for you. You are through, Mr. Saunders. Can I help? Would you tell Mr. Clive that James Fuller is here to see him? Yes, of course. Mrs. Layton, Mr. Fuller is here to see Mr. Clive. Yes, I will. Thank you. Will you go right in, please? Through that door. Thank you. Come in. Uh, will you say I'll see Mr. Milne after lunch? And I'll see Woolsey at three if he's got his facts together by then. Hello, Fuller. I'm very glad to see you. How do you do, Mr. Clive? Right on the minute, aren't you, too? I like that. Sit down. I've just been glancing over your papers, as a matter of fact. Your experience, your business background. Quite impressive for a young man. Thirty-six. Hmm? Yes. I'm pleased to see that in your first year in prison, they put you to accountancy. Work you were trained for. It's amazing to find the civil service acting so intelligently, don't you think? They do a good job on the whole, Mr. Clive. You came to England during the war. 
towards the end of it. But your family is still in Canada, I believe. Yes. But you decided to stay on. Well, I preferred it here. Well, now, to be honest with you, Fuller, when I heard the entire story, I hesitated giving you a chance. Normal reaction, I think you'll agree. But one man changed my entire thinking. I don't need to tell you who that was, I suppose. Dr. McNally. You didn't know he came to see me? No. Yes, he did. When he was transferred here from his prison appointment a month ago. You'll be reporting to him, I believe. It's a condition of my parole. Yes, sir, he said. He came to see me one evening. Came several evenings, in fact. I admit I, I resisted at first, but then... <laughs> well, he's a very direct, a very tenacious man, Dr. McNally, wouldn't you say? Yes, I would. Well, now, with reference to this prison matter, your offence... Uh, your illness, strictly speaking. He not only convinced me that you're absolutely cured, but he has a great belief in you and your ability. As to that, I, I can soon form my own opinion, can't I? Well, now that we've cleared the air a little, as to your job. You'll have no specific duties at the moment. I want you to familiarize yourself with this organization. This is a growing, flourishing city, Fuller. And my organization is a part of that growth. I want to be one of the leaders of it. I want my employees to feel the same. Well, we may as well get started. Yes, Mr. Clive? Would you come in a moment, Ruth? My secretary, Ruth Layton. She knows you've been in prison, but nothing more than that. And nobody else here knows even that much. I think you'll like working here, Fuller. We work hard and we relax hard. Oh, Ruth. Ruth, this is Mr. Fuller, Mrs. Layton. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Mrs. Layton will show you where your office is. She'll also give you all the material you need to get started. The object? Well, learn all you can about us. And I'd like to hear what you think. Yes, Mr. Clive. And thanks again. I don't want to hear any more about that. Good luck. These are the general offices. Foreign interest, investment, idea and advertising. We have expanded so quickly, everything is pretty much lumped together. Salesman, general typing and secretarial staff. You are in one of the executive offices. Well, that's a very sudden promotion. Things happen that way at Clive Enterprises. I think you like working here. Mr. Clive thought so, too. No. Oh, Ruth, that Waterford chap's been calling me. I've been holding him off till Mr. Clive makes up his mind. He's considering the matter now. Mr. Milne, this is Mr. Fuller. Oh, pleased to meet you. I heard you were coming. We can always use another good hand. You like working here. Did, did I say something funny? No, Mr. Milne. I'd be obliged if you'd let me know the minute the chief decides. Roy Milne, second in command. He was here at the start when Mr. Clive was sales representative for Northern Manufacturers. Do you like it? Very comfortable. Mr. Clive supervised all the decorating. He probably said that too. No, not that. For a start, I have picked this from the files for you. Uh, articles of incorporation of our several companies, model contracts, lists of personnel and their assignments. There's a great deal more to come, but I didn't mean to overwhelm you on your first day. I will have to find my bearings. It's the efficiency that's a little overwhelming. The speed, at any rate. Mr. Clive's doing as well as the decorating. But there are compensations that make Clive Enterprises quite unusual. There's a free exchange of ideas here. No politics, no secrets. And you'll find that most of the people mind their own business. What I mean is... You mean I especially might resent it if they didn't? No, of course not. I'm aware you know I was in prison, Mrs. Layton. So there's no need ever to try to be kind or tactful. I'm sorry. If there's any other material you need or you have any questions, just let me know. I appreciate your help. Not at all. Mrs. Layton? That was rude of me a moment ago. I apologize. That's quite all right.
in. That you, Jimmy? Yes. All right, I'll be with you in a second. Take your time. Sorry to keep you waiting. Don't you think it's nice of the state to furnish me with private accommodations? Makes me feel like a Harley Street specialist. Hmm? Yeah, you look fine. Uh, take your coat off and sit down. No. Where's that farm of yours? Huh? How do you like the city, Doctor? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I like it and sometimes I wish I were back at the institution. Same question to you. It's a nice place. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be polite with me, you know. I'm not a member of the Chamber of Commerce. Where the hell is that form of yours? Well, according to the book, when you can't find something, it's because you don't want to find it. Oh, very amusing. Ah, here we are. You know, you may be right. If anything I loathe, it's filling out for all forms. Now, James Fontaine, new name Fuller. Released from the institution, when was it, a day or two ago? Two, on the 21st. Two on the 21st, all right. Attitude of the parolee is good and seems to be making satisfactory adjustment. That's true, isn't it? I suppose so. Meaning you are? Meaning I suppose so. Hmm. Like to have a cigarette? No, thank you. Oh, I forget you don't like my Turkish. Excuse me. Hmm? Okay, you light up. You light up while I tell the parole board exactly what they like to hear. All right, and then you can light up if you want to. Now, we'll meet here about three times a week, and we'll talk. Tell me, you'll do most of the talking. And I'll tell you why. This is called group therapy. That means that a lot of people get together and talk about themselves and each other. They try to find out what makes them tick, or why they commit crimes, for instance. And there's reasons that they do, you know. They're not just born that way. These reasons go way back. We want to dig them out. They go back to the time you were born. And then maybe, well, maybe you'll find out what's steering you instead of the other way around. It won't be easy for you to say some of the things you're going to have to say. I won't push you. There's one thing I want to make clear. Whatever's said in this room stops right here. If any of you feel that you can't keep the confidences of your fellow men, you can leave right now. Leave the room, that is. I don't think you'll get much farther. <laughs> well, who wants to start? Any questions? There's no rush. There's plenty of time. I don't see why the hell I should sit here. It may be okay for you, Lax. But I don't even belong here. No. Who's that, sir? Come on, Anarcha. Look, I'm in here on a bum stair. It was all effects, I tell you. All effects. Suppose you tell us about it, Anarcha. Do you mind? Do you mind, James? Jimmy, do you mind? Oh, sorry. Your present address. Well, you are living someplace, I take it. 428 St. Mark's Road. 428 St. Mark's Road. Where were you? No place in particular. Mm -hmm. Your cigarettes still smell pretty awful. They're like dirty feet, wasn't it? The day I said that, I wanted to kill you. Well, it was the day I knew you were on your way. All right, James. How's it going? Fine. Thanks to you. Thanks to yourself. The job, I mean. Oh, yes, the job. Well. <laughs> How's it look? Looks like you had to work pretty hard on a fellow named Clive. Clive? Oh, oh yes. Oh, come now, Doctor. We must be direct and honest with our patients. All right, so I talk to him. He's a chap. He's got connections with the prison authorities. He has jobs. And he prides himself on his social conscience, so I thought I'd take him up on it. And what do you think of him? Interesting. He's an ambitious type. <laughs> he's begging for a heart attack. But basically, I think he's a pretty decent fellow. Oh, so he took some persuading. Wouldn't you in his place? Look, Doc, I, j I just wanted to say thanks. Well, let him thank me. He's lucky to have you. <coughs> Finding these uh, first few days a little rough? Well, knowing I was going to see you helped. Mm-hmm. You sleeping? Yes. You having any of those nightmares? 
Now and then. And how often is now and then? I had one last week, the night before I came out. A small one, just the other night. How small is a small one? Not king size. Not about problem number one. Well, there's no sense putting up with that, is there? You got to have your sleep. Here, pills. If you're not sleeping, don't be heroic. Take a pill. Huh? What's this place like you're living at? I'm boarding with an elderly couple. How is it? I think it's going to be all right there. They're nice people. Is there anything not all right about it? No. And why the frown? Well, I had a scare for a moment this morning. I thought the landlady's husband recognized me. What made you think that? My face looked familiar, he said. He could have seen my picture in the paper at the time. He didn't recognize you. Look, James, it was a long, long time ago, and images fade, especially newspaper images. Is that the whole story? Yes, except for moments like that all day long. Well, that's only natural at first. And the world looks a lot different, even a little frightening. Well, naturally. After three years, you can't expect in two days to catch up with a life that's run way ahead of you. Then what's so good about coming out and meeting the world head on? Why not a few more days or a week in the privacy of my hotel room, where I didn't have to see so many people? You think that would have helped? Well, I know, but... Do you know? Well, I have a few doubts, but that's reasonable, isn't it? It depends. Do you have doubts about it happening again? Well, what have I got? Your word, it won't. I never said it won't. I said I'd be surprised if it did. I recommended your release. I never would oh, have recommended right, you stop release. needling me. I'm not needling you. Look, I've had enough of that in the institution. If I'm all right, why don't you leave me alone? Here, let me uh, warm up your coffee. It's just like old times, isn't it? Yes. I still want to kill you now and then. I can't hurt. Well, why do I if I'm all right? Well, James, let's say that you're convalescent. You know, it takes time to be objective about the methods and the people that are trying to help you. But you just remember one thing, that being out is part of the therapy, too. Mm. And your coffee's worse than your cigarettes. Well, that's, uh, that's all for me. That's all for me, too. I'll go on home. Next Friday again? Same time. Any evening you want to talk, just give me decent notice. It's very kind of you, Doctor. Is that your homework? Good weekend company, I thought. Well, don't knock yourself out. Good night. Good night, Jimmy. So, uh, shall I tell you something funny? You can try. That place I live. Do you know what I found on the wall near my bed? Can't imagine. Blue boy. You don't say. Funny. Did you leave it there? Yes. Then it's funny. Good night, Doctor. Come on, Fantine. The earliest thing you remember as a child. Just say it. Can't hurt. What are you afraid of? Don't just sit there, man. Come on, boy. Oh, everybody else is talking. What makes you so? All right, it? hold the chaps now. Come on, Fontaine. The earliest thing you remember. Was it something naughty, Jimmy? I, uh, dirty a little. It was Blue Boy. Make something of that. What's Blue Boy? It's a painting of a boy. Oh. You don't say. I've seen it. It's a pretty boy with curls. Oh, 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 who liked her? My mother, I suppose. Did you like your mother, Jim? Naturally. What was she like? Well, she was my mother. What did your father do? He was a clerk in an insurance house. She was the only child? No. How many others? Five. Are you the oldest or what? The youngest. And the others? How many boys? How many girls? What's the matter, Jim? Can't you remember? All girls. Five girls, I... Yes, <laughs> you know, let her go home. I have three, I thought that was bad. <laughs> all right, all right, I said. That makes you pretty special, doesn't it? What do you mean, special? Are you the youngest and the only boy? What are you trying to make of that? Mama's boy. Who says you? Mama's like a blue boy. I just love you, girl. I 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 love you,
said break it up now and sit down now. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, did you sleep well? Very well, thank you. Come and sit down. And I'll have your breakfast in a moment. Uh, you'll start with porridge, of course. Yes, thank you. And eggs, scrambled. Oh, that'll be fine. Mr. Fuller knows porridge is the way to start the day. Yes, I know, Mother, but eggs every morning, too. They're good for you. Yes, but it's all... Uh, no, I don't want to hear another word about it, Arnold. I haven't been as well as I might be. No old leg wound acting up again. First World War, that was. <laughs> you were in the last war, I imagine? Yes. Infantry? Merchant Marine. Oh, well, they did their job, too. <sighs> You'll be having all your meals with us today, I imagine. Being Saturday and no work. Well, I did bring some work home with me. I will have lunch, if I may. Not so huh? Well, I wanted to see something of the uh, city this evening. Oh. Oh, well, if that's what you'd like. It'd be nice if I could uh, show you around a bit, eh? But we know that's out of the question, dear. The legs are getting cold, Arnold. Yes? Disturbing you? It's all right. Mustn't overdo it, you know. The legs are rather bad today. Oh, you don't mind? Hmm. I was wondering, uh, the last war, did you manage to get to Paris? Yes, once for about three weeks. Thirty-eight years since I was there. Most wonderful place I was ever in. All oh, the girls. Did you ever go to the Follies? No. Arnold, where are you? Are you bothering Mr. Fuller? He's just looked in for a moment, Mother. I'll be right down. We'll drop round to the pub sometime, you and I, a few drinks and a Arnold! This takes you right up through the last quarter. And that's about all of it, I'm glad to say. So am I. You have been through a tremendous amount of material. When you're ready for Mr. Clive, would you just let me know a day or so ahead? Has he asked? Yes, but not meaning to hurry you. There's no need to say till you're certain. Good night. Good night. No, my mother was afraid of men, really. I mean, of, well, how rough they can be. It's quite true, you know. You heard me tell Arnold to be back by nine. Oh, look, here I am nattering away about my troubles, and you've troubles of your own, no doubt. You will tell me about them sometime, won't you? Of course, Mrs. Cartwright. But if you'll excuse me now, I have some reading to do before going to bed. Mr. Fuller. Yes? I wish you'd call me Gertrude. Uh, if you call me Jim. Oh. Good night. Oh. You've been at the pub, and you're drunk. I only had one mother. I can smell half a dozen. You made me a solemn promise. Can't a man my age at just wondering. I won't have it, Arnold. Go up to your room. Oh, I'm sorry, Mother, but it... Yeah. Stop it. What will Mr. Fuller think? Fine example you set for your son. Sneaking out with your dreadful friends, coming home real and drunk. Don't move. You sit right there and listen to me till I've finished. Papa, let's fight! <laughs> Please. Oh. 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 You hit him where? You heard me. Why there? How do I know? It was an accident. There ain't no accidents. That right, Doc? Right. Huh. Are you saying I purposely hit him there? You hated his guts. I loved him. That spineless clot? I did. But little boy Blue loved Mama more. Fix Papa for good and you've got Mama. 
You're a louse, Hackle. You got something there, Jim. He's got a mind like a sewer. Then why did you fight at all? I didn't. I was just playing. Is that all? I don't know. Perhaps to make Papa look more like a man. What do you mean, look like a man? He was. Was he? Or did your mother rob him of his manhood? And weren't you afraid that she'd rob you of yours, too? And that's why I hit him. I knew that at the age of five, huh? Your instincts could have. My subconscious? Yes. Rubbish. Why? How can you say I was fighting for my manhood and at the same time say what Acker said? That you wanted your mother? Yes. Well, both things could be true. I'm a child of five, it's a big dilemma. Besides, your mother had a problem. Yes. While taking away your manhood, she wanted you to have it at the same time for her. Your mind's as rotten as Acker's. Let's go over it again, Jim. I won't go over it again and get that lousy cigarette out of my face. It smells like dirty feet! <laughs> I swear, Mother, it was no more than one glass. Stop that whining. Well, it... Aren't you ashamed? In short, you seem to think that our organization is pretty messy, hmm? Well, all right, messy. There are at least ten business activities going on here. Most of them unrelated to one another. Have you seen our latest statement of earnings, Fuller? Yes. Impressive, wouldn't you say? Yes. Achieved by the system we have now, with sole authority in Mr. Clive and decisions carried out by me. I don't question Mr. Clive's competence or yours. Oh, but you do. You don't think, for instance, that we can take over and run a small plastics factory at this time. I said you shouldn't with the present staff. The present staff can handle it without working up a, an extra ounce of sweat. Yes, but gradually your personnel must become less and less specialized, and every activity less competently carried out. Greatest bit of nonsense I've ever heard. Right. An enormously successful operation. A business school expert walks in here to make an important job for himself. Right, please. Now, Fuller, are you prepared to go to work on the sort of plan you suggest? Why, yes. And plastic deal, meanwhile? I'll decide that. Now, are you prepared to do this, Fuller? As Mr. Milne says, this is an important job. I'd have to learn a great deal more about these companies. Above all, I'd have to study the staff, their training and abilities. I'll need time. Of course. You'll be the sole judge of the time you need. Then I'd like to try it. Thanks, Will. Well, that's all for the moment, I believe. Uh, wait a minute, Roy. Excuse me. These are some notes of Mr. Clive's on certain of the personnel. He thought you might find them useful. Just what did you do to him this morning? Why? May I have one of your cigarettes? Yes. Now, Mrs. Layden, there was a chap in prison who used to sidle up to his cellmates and say, the parole board's been discussing you. And he'd lie down and refuse to say another word. Is he still alive? I doubt it. It's good news, obviously. Well, why is that? Simply, he came into my office just after you had left and said, interesting fellow, that fuller. You're going to work on a plan for changes around here, I'm told? Yes. If I may make a suggestion, Mr. Fuller. There is no need to feel pressure. Not any longer. You mind? No, of course not. For one thing, I've seen you dashing out for a sandwich at noon and dashing back. Why not celebrate with a proper lunch for once? An executive lunch? There's the Cavalier nearby, a very good pub. That's why I usually go. Would you like to come along? Oh, well, yes. Thank you. All right. Meet you in the reception room in half an hour. Fine. You say Milne opposed the idea rather strongly? How strongly? Well, he was emphatic, let's say. <laughs> you don't seem much disturbed by it all. Right now, I'm experiencing that executive feeling. I believe the slogan is, work hard, relax hard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Clive has several of those. They sound a little pompous, I know. Actually, he's very bright. And a very warm and generous man. I believe that. You'd imagine he had no time for anything outside his work. Yet I have known him to take time for a feeling or a principle. It's one thing to boast about feelings and quite another to do something about it. Did you think you had to defend him to me? No, I didn't. I am grateful to him, if that's what you meant to remind me of. I meant nothing of the sort. As for feelings, was it a feeling like Clive's that made you suggest lunch? Part of the rehabilitation Will program? Will you stop? Is there something else, sir? No, thank you. Just come for me. For me, too. I'm a fool. 
Will you accept that as an apology? If you'll accept a few remarks first. My husband was a lawyer. He used to tell me about men in prison. They were all sensitive, but they didn't go out of their way to be rude. When I say those things about Mr. Clive, I was thinking of myself, if you want to know. And of my own gratitude for all he did for me three years ago when my husband died. Do you understand now? I'm very sorry. Inez, can you get me Mrs. Layton, please? Mrs. Layton has just walked through. But I'll try to find her for you, Mr. Fuller. No, never mind. I'll try again later. Thank you. Answer Acker's question, Jim. I didn't hear it. Answer Acker's question, Jim. I'll ask again, Sonny. Did you it's ever... none of your business. You're just naturally filthy. Filthy, he calls it. <laughs> Damn as hell, Sonny. All right, now, quiet. Um, <laughs> let me put it another way, Jim. Did you ever love a woman? We don't mean take her to the pictures, man. <laughs> of course he doesn't. His mommy wouldn't let him. Oh, days. Suppose I said I did. Did what? Loved a woman. Glory be. Would he be known if he did or not? <laughs> quiet now. <laughs> Where was that, Jim? During the war in Paris. Ah. Oh. That was the best time of all. What are you doing, Agatha? Getting yourself a cheap thrill? <laughs> Who was she? An American girl named Ellen. Where'd you meet her? The Red Cross Club. She worked there. What happened? Well, come on, Sonny. You said you made it for this check. I did. Yeah. Was she pick up? Was she something more? What do you mean? How long did you know her? Two, three weeks. Why? Well, I just meant, was she a nice girl herself? Yes. You thought you were in love with her? I suppose so, yes. Well, did you, didn't you? I said I did. What was she like? What do you want me to do, draw your dirty pictures? Yes, Sonny, could you do just that? You better have Agatha shut up, McNally. The rule is we answer here, Jim. Come on, tell us, blue boy. Did you like her? He wants to go back to his cell and think about it all night. No, I didn't. No? What happened? Well, why not, Jimmy boy? Come on, tell us. Well, she was an infomaniac. What? Sex crazy. Do you understand that? What makes you think so? Yeah, how would you know? Point in. You love this girl, you said? I thought so. Did she love you? What if she did? Don't you know? Two people care about each other. They got a right to ask a lot of each other. What happened? Well, I couldn't stand her. I walked out on her. What did she say? She didn't say anything. No? You didn't give her a chance. Chance? She didn't want a chance in the first place. That is trouble, Doc. You didn't want a chance, huh? Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 Having a bit of a nap? No. Now, now, Fuller, we had our little differences in the chief's office, but that's a matter of business, isn't it? Yes, of course. Matter of fact, I admired the way you stuck to your guns. There may be a certain merit in this proposal of yours. Now, I told the chief, as to the matter of the personnel, I'd be glad to give you all the information you need. Work along with you, so to speak. Thanks, ma'am. Not at all. It's all for the cause, isn't it? Uh, to start with, I'll get up a set of notes, let you have them as soon as possible. Fine. Well, well, good night, Fuller. Good night. No hard feelings, I hope. No hard feelings. Seriously, we can use a man with your training around here. We can indeed. Is Mrs. Layton, please. Yes, Mr. Fuller. Hello? Hello, it's Jim Fuller. Well, if you're busy, I can... No, not terribly. I just wanted to apologize again. That isn't necessary. Well, aside from that, I had a nice lunch. I'm glad. Perhaps we can again sometime. Yes. Well, back to work, I guess. Yes. Thanks for calling.
go on with your story. There's nothing more to tell. I tried to make myself stand there for a full minute. I could only manage a few seconds. Well, why'd you stand there and torture yourself? I wanted to prove to myself that I could. I see, and if you've been an alcoholic, would you consider it smart to keep a case of whiskey in the room? Is that a very good analogy? Well, it's not very good, but has certain basic similarities, that's all. The fact is, the moment I'm faced with a problem... Were you, or did you stand there and imagine a problem? It's still a problem. How? Three years ago, you probably wouldn't have walked away. All right, James. What's really bothering you? What I've told you. How's the job? Fine. Really? Clive thinks I'm an interesting fellow. Well, well. Will you give him time? Is that what he said? Not to me, Mrs. Layton. It's his secretary, isn't she? Yes. I met her. She's a pretty nice person. Are people treating you all right where you live? Couldn't be better. Yeah. You're sleeping? Yes. And you put this blue boy thing in its proper place, I hope? Yes. It's made me remember a bit, that's all. Any hand on what you remember? Yes, Doctor. Well, give me a sample. Of what? Of the stuff that's coming back. <laughs> it's pretty pointless. Anyway. Well, I thought of Ellen yesterday afternoon. Ellen? The girl I knew in Paris. Oh, yes. Well, what about her? Nothing. I just thought of her. Now, what made you... Dr. McNally. No, no, Hazel, I told you I had a patient at this hour. Yes, but I specifically asked you never to call... Look, darling, I told you I couldn't meet you there before 10. Well, I'm sorry if I gave you that impression, but I... Uh... Hello? Hazel? I think you've got a problem, huh? When a man, particularly a doctor, waits to my age to consider matters, well... I'm sorry, James. It's your hour, not mine. Now, what I meant was... What started you thinking of Ellen? Nothing in particular. Or what did you recall exactly? That she wasn't an infomaniac. She was just a normal woman making demands on me that I wasn't ready to meet. Normal demands you couldn't meet. All right, Doctor, we know. Is that all? Well, and how poisonous Zaka was that day. That all? Doctor, do you mind? That's all. So you and Clive are really hitting it off. We had a battle yesterday. I had to stand my ground. And Mrs. Layton told you that he thought that you were a pretty interesting fellow. Yes. That's rather chummy. What's rather chummy? Well, that's little confidences from the front office. Are you suggesting something? <laughs> not really. I just think it's uh, very nice. Well, let's not be coy, Doctor. It so happens she and I have worked together this past week, and I find it quite natural. Oh, so do I. I find it quite natural that we had lunch together once or twice. Oh, you did. As a matter of fact, we did once, yesterday, for the first time. <laughs> oh, McNally, you're a genius. It's a lousy lunch, if that helps you any. We had a bra. Well, what about? I was being sensitive, while she was being nothing but friendly. You patched it up? More or less, I don't know. And you went back to work? Naturally. And you thought of Ellen? It was in the afternoon, I believe you said. Well, that's silly. I don't really know, Mrs. Layton. But you'd like to. I don't have any idea. You don't have to have. Our instincts run miles ahead of our ideas. Any mystery about that? So the first normal attractive woman, I mean. Like Ellen. All right, like Ellen. The first after three years of raking up my life and my fear is, am I really well now? Or will I run away again? I'm afraid to face the question. I refuse to see any connection with Ellen. Why? Because I'm still that unsure of myself? Well, who's sure of anything? Well, that's no answer. We have to find our own, don't we? Yes, Doctor. And being out, applying what we know is part of the cure, huh? We know what happens to buried fears, don't we? They can lead you to pick a fight with someone like Mrs. Layton just to make sure that you never have to face the test of a normal woman. Buried stuff like that can cause an incident, like at the playground this morning. Is that right, Doctor? Very good. Let's call it a night, shall we? It's all right with me. One point you missed, Doctor. Yes? A woman I happen to find attractive is married. Oh. Safe, you see. Good. Except she isn't. Her husband's dead. And you found this out at lunch? Yes. Well, 
That's very amusing in a ghoulish sort of a way. What was your first reaction? I don't know. Well, were you pleased? Were you scared? Or what? Both. You want to see her again? I don't think she wants to see me. Well, it's not what I asked you. Yes, I do. Satisfied? Delighted. That's Hazel. You better get out of here. I don't want this phone call to discourage you. Yes, my darling. Yes, darling. Yes, darling. Morning, Inez. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Come in. Good morning. Good morning. I was beginning to think you were avoiding me. Well, when I talked to you on the phone the other day, you were so formal sounding. I... I'm sorry. I thought you felt you had to be polite. Well, I meant what I said. Oh, we have cleared that up. Well, Ruth, can I see you sometime? After work, I mean. Yes, of course. Are you free this evening? Yes, I am. I'll call for you around eight. Well, I could pick you up. You might as well use my car. Except I don't know where you live. Well, you might have trouble finding it. Let's say outside the post office. All right, it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Let's have one cigarette where it's nice and quiet. What did you think of our French restaurant? <laughs> Very English. <laughs> <laughs> I smoke too much. No willpower. You too? Mm. I smoke anything with tobacco except Turkish. If you come to like England, you can like the rain. Is that odd? Just a little. Were you ever in Switzerland? No. I was born in Lucerne. I met Arthur there. He was with the British consulate. What I meant was... When we married and he brought me home to England, he was so proud of this country. He was even proud of the rain. How long ago was that? Nearly 12 years. Mr. Clive was one of his first clients. That is when Arthur set up his law practice. He would have had a wonderful career. I better not get off on that. Tell me about it. There isn't much to tell. He was a fine man, understanding, sweet. Irritable only now and then. Were you happy? Yes. Years of nice, warm happiness. I didn't know how nice till they were gone. You see, he died in his office. No warning, nothing. His heart stopped and he was dead. I remember when, when he left that morning, I leaned out of the window and called to him something about bringing home some wine. We were having company. Strange. When lives are cut off like that, it isn't only the one dying, the other one dies too. I died the minute that phone call came. For a long time I stayed that way. I was completely destroyed. Just wanted to be a vegetable. If it hadn't been for Janie and the demand she made, I would have been. Children are amazing. No time for mourning, just living. It has stopped. Let's walk a little. Would you like to? Yes. Those painful memories of mine have stirred up a few of your own, haven't they? A few. Jim, I had no intention of doing that. It's all right. But you've wondered about mine, though, haven't you? 
I can't deny it. I know Clive didn't tell you. Only that he was certain it was all in the past. And that was good enough? It was good enough, yes. Please, don't tell me now. Not until it's in the past for you. Don't you see? It couldn't matter for the moment. You know, this has been the nicest evening in a long time. And that's the only thing that does matter now. Hmm? Isn't that true? We ought to start home, hmm? Thank you, Jim. When will I see you again? Will you come to the house next time? For one thing, I don't want to scramble for a sitter for Janie. I sent her to my neighbor tonight. Margaret has two girls. Janie loves spending the night there. How about Friday? She has no school the next day. For dinner, I mean. You can't? Well, yes. Friday will be fine. Well, good night, Jim. Good night. I couldn't help it. Unspeakably vile. I didn't want to. Please believe me. Jim. Please. Jim, wake up. Poor boy. You've been having a nightmare. I'm sorry. Can I get you anything, Jim? No, I'm all right. Oh. Be fine. What was it? Tell me about it. Was it to do with the war? I don't remember. You can tell me, you know. I don't remember. Well, try and go to sleep now. And I'll sit here quietly beside you until... Please, I'm all right. I... I'm fine now. You... you don't have to wait up. I'll be all right. Oh, Jim. Good night, dear. Good night, Gertrude. Jim, are you clear so far? You were sick when you knew Ellen. You had been sick for a long time. And after the war, when you grew older, that sickness became worse. Because you had a normal, natural drive to find a woman you could live with, and because that drive you had within you became distorted, adult women weren't acceptable. They made demands. They became a threat to you. When you were in terror, what could happen? Then when you quit your job, you began to drift. You were too restless to work. You were looking for something. Do you understand, Jim? Now, whether you know it or not, you were looking for an answer to your physical problem. You began looking for younger and younger girls, girls still too young to have experience who wouldn't challenge you. What I'm trying to point out is, Jim, that finally you became very, very sick. And what you eventually did was a symptom of your illness. Nothing more and nothing less. You didn't happen to pass that playground. It was inevitable. That's what you were looking for. That's why you came back time after time. You didn't tell yourself why. You didn't know. 
All you knew was a great pressure somewhere inside you had begun to loosen, to relax. What did you say to them, Jim? I remember. Come on, man. Please, cool. When you started picking them up after school, buying them sweets and things, you mean you had no idea? No, I don't. Day after day, three days in a row, and you had no idea? You got rid of the other one, is that it? No, I didn't. You must have wangled it somehow. I didn't, Patricia did. She told Doris to walk on ahead. I didn't do it, Patricia did. You mean a ten-year-old kid arranged for you and her to be alone? <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute, wait a minute, fellas. Just for the record, small girls, even at that age, can be seductive. It's not usually conscious, but it's there. But he did want it to happen, didn't he? I didn't. She said, why don't we take a ride in the car? She said? I'm telling you, before God, I swear it! Why do you want to be locked up? I had to. I was sick. He was cold, but that night he began to help himself. That last moment in the car, the control he fought for, that was the first step on the way back. That's why he made no defense at the trial. He wanted to be in prison, ask for help. Do you understand that, Jim? Do you understand what happened? Do you, Jim? Do you understand, Jim? First advertising contract we ever had. Still going strong. You a little out of sorts this morning? No. Hmm. You know, I had no idea you existed until the day before you came. Never even heard of you coming for an interview. You didn't, did you? No, a friend of mine put me in touch with Mr. Clive. Is he? Business acquaintance? Someone I might know? No, just a friend of Mr. Clive's. How about the advertising personnel, Mr. Mill? Uh, yes. Um... Here we are. Background, length of employment, assignments they're handling at present. Mm -hmm. I had a nightmare a few nights ago. Same one? A few variations, mostly the same. Playground, Patricia, Judge. Anything you couldn't handle? No. You want to see Mrs. Layton tomorrow night? Easy guess, wasn't it? Why else would I ask for a change of nights? You been with her again recently? A few nights ago. How was it? Fine. Seen quite a bit of the lady, aren't you? Let's not jump to conclusions, Doctor. Oh, ego, sex, opportunity. Mix them all together and you've got the poet's dream. Love. 
It's pretty cynical for a man who's about to be married. <laughs> well, I still think that marriage is the best thing that can happen to a man or a woman. How does she feel? I wouldn't know. You realize that three years ago you would have been terrified of her? Are you still a bit afraid? Is that it? What makes you think so? The nightmare, for example. She has a daughter. About ten years old, I would say. That shakes you a little, doesn't it? No, but obviously it shook you. You know better, don't you? Yes, Doctor. It all came out beautifully in therapy. Most crimes are the acting out of some inner conflict, and all of us have such conflicts, and so-called normal people control them. Sick people act them out as I did. Once you understand your conflicts, why... You sound normal enough. And on the surface, I can function normally. But what you don't seem to understand is that inside, half of the time, I shake like a leaf. Everybody does from time to time, and that is something you don't understand. Except in my case, there has to be that moment. That test of whether I'm actually cured or not. Not cured, well, nobody's cured of their inner conflicts. They're always there. A man is well when he can understand them and he can deal with them. And anybody that tells you any difference is a liar and a quack. Yes, Doctor, I know. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, I... I don't mean to make light of your doubts. My date with Ruth tomorrow night is at her house. Do you understand now? Are you going? Would you suggest I do? I wouldn't suggest anything. Oh, it's my problem, huh? You work it out. You're a big help, Doctor. Oh, you see the abuse we take in this profession. Greatly obliged. It smells wonderful. What is it? Jim! Oh, look at him, all spit and polish. <laughs> There's plenty here for you, too, Jim. Uh, no, thanks, Gertrude. I'm invited out. Yeah, don't you know, Mother, Jim's got a girl. Is this true, Jim? Somebody's been seeing a great deal of lately. You... you like this girl? I think so. Well, I hope you'll be very happy, Jim. Well, Gertrude, I scarcely know the girl. Good night, Arnold. Good, Good night. night, Jim. Oh, I don't suppose he wants to get married, Mother. Be quiet, Arnold. Mr. Fuller. You are James Fuller, aren't you? Yes. Detective Division. Will you come along with us, please? Oh, why? They want to talk with you at the station. Come along, please. What do they want to talk to me about? We don't know, Mr. Fuller. I'd like to make a phone call. Your lawyer? A place where I'm expected. Sorry. Only your lawyer until you've been questioned. What is it? What do they want to question me about? Sorry. You'll have to wait. James Fontaine, is that correct? Yes. Sit down, Fuller. Sorry to have kept you waiting, but it was unavoidable. Certain things we had to check. Have you any idea why? No, but I'd like to know. Do you know a little girl by the name of Lois Springer? No. Are you certain? A girl about 11. Pretty little girl. No, I don't know. Were you in Princess Lane any time today? No. Have you ever been in Princess Lane? Well, I've passed by there once or twice. But not today. No, not today. Well, we'll tell you what we know, Mr. Fuller, then you can tell us what you know. In Princess Lane, there's a bomb site, a rather deserted place. Someone took little Lois there today as she was coming home from school just after three and brutally assaulted, criminally assaulted her. Now, Lois may die. If she does, the charge is not only criminal assault, but murder. Look, I don't know. There is evidence from Lois herself and other people. 
Was the man about your height, about your coloring, wearing a blue suit like you were? I don't know anything about it. You don't? What makes you assume I do? That should be obvious, Fuller. Suppose you tell us where you were this afternoon. I was in my office. Can you establish that? Yes. The reception girl would have seen me if I had left. At Clive Enterprises, isn't it? Yes. Just a minute. It was shortly after three, you said. At 3.15, I was with Mr. Clive himself. What's Clive's first name? Don't you know? Andrew. Home address? Well, I don't know. I haven't been with him all that long. Uh, just relax a moment, Paul. May I make a phone call first? Sorry, not quite yet. can say with such precise Thanks. Right. Sorry, you do understand, of course. Yes, I understand. Excuse me, could I talk to you for a moment? Sorry. Just a minute. Any information on the Springer case? That's what you hear no, about. No, go Isn't away, it? will you? Uh, Fontaine. I'd like to have a word with you, Mr. Fontaine. The name is Fuller. Ah, yes, I understand. My name's Austin. Uh, you wouldn't remember me, of course, but... Uh, I covered your trial in London. It seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? I gather you've been questioned about the Springer case. And that you've been cleared. Yes, that's right. I've been cleared. Oh, I'm very glad. I'd have bet you would have been. Yours wasn't the usual case at all. I'm sure you could use a drink. Sorry, I've got to make a phone call. Well, there's a phone in the pub up the street. You could get a bite there, too, if you've missed your dinner. Ruth, on my way over, I was picked up by the police. Why? Nothing important, just routine about my parole. But I couldn't call till I was released. You are all right, aren't you? Yes, of course. But I ruined your dinner. Don't worry about that. Have you eaten anything? Well, no. I could warm something up for you. Well, no, thanks, Ruth. It's pretty late. I'll get a sandwich and then go on home. Just as you said, Jim. Good night, Ruth. Good night. Complications? No more than usual. Huh. I thought you might like those. Oh, thanks. I've often wondered why you made no attempt to defend yourself during your trial. Uh, you seemed so confused. I was sick. Extraordinary. I mean that you knew that you were and yet insisted on being sent away. And you've had therapy all this time. Yes. And you judged that... Others that judged that I was well. I'm very glad. A new name, new start. I take it you're working now? Yes. Oh, good, good. What a world. This case this afternoon, I was thinking, if such fellows had had the treatment you've had... It doesn't work that way, Mr... Uh, Austin. You want a newspaper up here? For a year or more now, yeah. bigger opportunities than London. Uh, what did you mean when you said it doesn't work that way? Well, I meant before a man can be treated, he has to commit the crime, doesn't he? Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm really very tired. I'd like to talk to you again, Fontaine. Fuller. Sorry. Uh, where do you live now? This should do it. No, 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 no. Good night, Austin. Good night, Fuller. Good luck. Jim, I thought it was Gertrude. Well, you're home a little early, aren't you? Yes, had dinner, that's all. I've got some work to do. Well, we could uh, go round to the pub for a minute. Afraid not tonight, Arnold. Oh, yes, have you heard about this, Jim? Another one of those sex crimes. Because Gertrude doesn't like me to buy this paper. Says they print trash, but there's lots of things here that you don't see. Eleven, eleven years old she was. It's a terrible thing. Would you like to take it up with you? No, thanks, Arnold. Good night. Good night.
I had to know you were all right. I was just going to you. Can you make it tonight, Jim? Yes. What? Well, under the circumstances, hadn't you better plan on opening a few tins or something? Sorry, no, I'll take one more chance. Seven o'clock? Fine. Why, you must be Jenny. Yes, I am. Please come in. Hang your things there, Mr. Fuller. Thank you. Come in. Please sit down. That's the most comfortable place. Thank you. Mummy will be down soon. She's a bit behind schedule. Oh. Would you like some sherry? Well, yes, I believe I would. Thank you very much. Well, I'll get it. No, I will. Please let me bring it. You work at Mr. Clive's, too. Yes. That's where your mommy and I met. I know. We waited a long time for you on Friday. Oh, please don't tell mommy I said that. Well, why not, Jenny? She told me not to, and I promised. It's quite all right. She did not explain, didn't she? You thought it was another evening, she said. Well, that's right. It was very simple and very stupid of me. But please don't say I said it. I won't. I promise. <laughs> well, good evening. Good evening. So nice to see you, Jim. Thank you. What was the big joke when I came in? Well, it's a little complicated. Oh, I see. Has Jenny looked after you? Mm. Mr. Fuller liked the sherry. Good. Thank you, dear. Are you hungry? Mm -hmm, very. You better be, because I'll be ready in just a few moments. Will you excuse me? Jenny, will you show Mr. Fuller into the dining room? This way, Mr. Fuller. But you can see that, can't you? This is very good, don't you think, Mr. Fuller? Mm, absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you both very much. But actually, fish was the only thing I had time to do. It isn't just fish, Mummy. Mm, I was going to say so. Grapes, olives, parmesan cheese. It's a French recipe. Mm, yes, dear. Mummy has just about every cookery book in the world. All right, it's all Veronique. A la Leighton. See? Friday night, Mummy made. What, Janie? What did I miss Friday night? Chicken and wine. Well, it serves me right. I never understand how I got my evening so confused. In any case, it couldn't have been better than this. I haven't been collecting very long. If you don't like pressed flowers, Jim, just say so. Well, I do. Start with violets. I have more of them than anything. I'll be in in two minutes, Jim, and then I'll start for you, Jim. There. I haven't told the names under them yet. You're not looking at them. Well, they're very beautiful and very neatly pressed. That's an African kind. I forget its name. I'm afraid I don't remember either. Oh, wait. A four-leaf clover. I found it myself. You did? Honest. I forget this one. It's a ragged robin. You do like flowers, don't you? I've learned a lot from them. You mean about them? No, from them. What do you mean? Well, let's take this ordinary violin. You have two of them. You'd say they were exactly the same. They are? No. If you look at them closely under a magnifying glass, you'll see there's some difference in the way nature made them. 
In all these millions and millions of years, nature never made two of anything alike. Nothing like you ever existed before. You're brand new. So are you, then? Yes. And if you know somebody, really, you know what's different about them. And if you like what's different about them, sometimes you can come to love them. Well, I'm afraid that's a little complicated. Will you say it again, please? No, not tonight, Jean. It's nearly nine o'clock. Oh, Mommy. I know, dear. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you remember where you left off, you and Mr. Fuller can continue next time. Night, Mr. Fuller. Good night, Jeannie. Please, will you come again? I hope so. Will you come up, Mommy? Yes, in a minute. You get ready for bed. Are you exhausted? Not at all. Oh, she exhausts me. <laughs> that little speech about getting your evening so confused. How did you know that was the official explanation? Who was it? She told you and then swore you to secrecy. I have nothing to say. Five minutes, Jim. Hmm? I may seem terribly busy, but it isn't all that difficult. I have a secret weapon, Mrs. Connors. She cooks, cleans, looks after Janie's clothes and mine. I supervise, but on the run, so to speak. It's remarkable, the things a woman can do on the run. Yes? Well, this home. Remarkable? To me. Why? Just whatever it was I sensed when I first walked in. And what was that? Well, I can't explain exactly. It's, well, this is the first real home I'd ever been in. The first home, you mean that? Yes. You had one as a boy. It's still the very first. Shall I make some more coffee? Oh, no, thanks, Rose. It's getting late, you know. Another minute, Jim. You know, ever since the other day, I wondered why of all nights I should have talked about myself like I did. The fact was, I think, that I wanted to for a long time. As if I knew I'd... I'd be healthier in a way if I did. But the trouble was, you see, it had to be someone who wanted to listen, someone I felt with, I mean, someone I could be sure of. Jim, please don't misunderstand. By sure of, I don't mean... <laughs> I mean, I... <laughs> I think you'd better go home. <laughs> oh, it's been a wonderful evening. You know, the last thing Jamie said was, couldn't we have Mr. Fuller for dinner again very soon? So you see, you made a big conquest tonight, and you know now how welcome you are. Thank you. Actually, Jim, if this is a home you like, it is yours in a sense, whenever you want it to be. And somewhere during the evening, I understood I didn't have to be afraid of Janie. Why, she was a child, and I was looking at her as a child, and nothing else. Evidently, I could see things in perspective. By perspective, I mean all evening long, I couldn't see what I'd been worried about before I got to the house. Does that make sense? The human mind, what a fabulous piece of machinery. It was Monday night I was at Ruth's. I never got there Friday. Please pick me up that night. Did you know that? On the Springer case? Yes. They held me nearly three hours. Ruth was waiting for me, and I wasn't allowed to phone. Was that the worst of it? That, in their eagerness to put the finger on me. Is that how it's going to be, Doctor? Are they going to drag me down to headquarters? Whoa, 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 Jimmy, whoa, Jimmy. Remember, I know how far you've come along. So do you. But the police, the police are historians at heart. You were, so you might still be. When a case like this happened... I had to tell Ruth about the police picking me up. A parole matter, I said. Nothing about the Springer case for me. She still doesn't know. First time we were out together and I heard about Janie, I wanted to tell her then. Why didn't you? Well, it takes a certain amount of courage, Doctor. She stopped me in a way. Couldn't matter, she said. She meant she wanted to know about me, what I was now, not what happened in the past. I suppose I wanted to think she was right. And after all, I wasn't sure then how I really felt about her. And you are now? 
with things that keep plaguing me. Am I really in love? Or am I trying to prove something? As I did when I forced myself to stand near that playground. Prove that I can have a normal relationship. That's what I need to know. And she wants to know me as I am. Well, once I tell her, will either of us have a chance to find out? I mean, can we go on normally after that? And yet, above all, with Janie, she should know. The question is exactly when. No suggestions, Doctor? I'm afraid not. Is my judgment good enough? It has to be, doesn't it? Well, thanks, Doctor. By the way, uh, that's sincere. I find that a bit disturbing. Go to a film tonight. Take a drive. Would you? No. <laughs> I keep you housebound so much. I can send Jeannie to Margaret's. I like being housebound. I think I'd rather stay in. Mommy! Here's something interesting, Mommy. What is it, dear? Remember the carnival that was here last year? Yes. Well, it's coming again. Oh, interesting. I couldn't go last time, remember? I had a bad cold. Yes, I remember. When you were a boy, Jim, did you ever go to a carnival? Oh, now and then. I think I'd like to go to this one. Why don't we all go? It's a wonderful idea. Wouldn't you like to, Mummy? Yes, I'd love to. Isn't it lucky I happened to see this? <laughs> no, really, Jim. I got to get you out. You could they take a drive on Saturday or Sunday if it's nice. It's beautiful now. Would you like to? Mm-hmm. A long drive, over the whole weekend, perhaps. Do you think we can do that? Why not? Perhaps even without Janie. Just to give everyone a change. It'll take a little explaining, but... Shall we plan on that? All right. I never thought I'd make it. I'm absolutely dead. Well, I want you. I'll ache for days. I don't mind. Then you better go right to bed. No, not yet. You do as I tell you. Now say goodnight like a good girl. Jim, how late can we start back tomorrow in order to be back by six? Oh, about three o'clock. Let's get up very early and make it the longest day we possibly can. Hmm? At seven? Seven? I think I'll make it. Good night.
Jean is driving Margaret frantic by now. Now, you don't have to drop me off. I can walk home. I want to. I can say goodbye to you properly in the car. I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's a comfort. Come to him. Hello, Fuller. Hmm? Nice to see you again. Oh, hello. Oh, this is my local. Are you from this district, too? Yes. Oh, Ruth, this is uh, Mr. Austin. How do you do? Oh, how do you do, Miss... Uh... Layton. Mrs. Layton. Been out in the country? Yes. Far out? The Lake District. Well, that's a long drive for one day. We got there yesterday. You excuse us, Austin, we have to run. Goodbye, Mr. Austin. Pleased to have met you, Mrs. Layton. <laughs> Not a close friend of yours, I hope. No. I couldn't help it. He was such an obvious snoop. I'm so happy. I just wanted someone to know. Even him. Come, let's run. Jim? Wonderful, thanks. Away alone overnight. Arnold, would you like a bite of supper, Jim? Well, no, thank you. I may slip down for something before I go to sleep. Jim, um, this girl you know. Mrs. Layton? Mrs.? Well, she's a widow, Gertrude. Oh. Well, we'd love to meet her sometime. If you're not ashamed of us, that is. Of course you'll meet her very soon. I promise. I'll keep something for you. Hello. I've been told I'm sloppy. So what do you think? Well, it looks like you're working through your problems very nicely, Doctor. Oh, we're in for one of them evenings, are we? What makes you so chipper tonight is if I didn't know. Have you ever been to the Lake District? It's very beautiful. How was it? I just told you. I know, but you didn't go to the lakes to look at the lakes. We're fine. No problems. Mm -mm. That could, don't huh? Oh, now you sound like a fellow I once knew named Acker. Oh, I'm sorry, Jimmy. I, I just meant, uh, any plans? Not especially. Why? Oh, no, I just asked. <laughs> just asked, that's all. Oh, by the way, by the way, there's something I wanted to tell you. See, Hazel and I, uh, Hazel and I were given an engagement party in a few weeks, so we'd like you to come. Thanks. Think I'll do as a married man? We all have to find our own answers, Doctor. <laughs> well, I wish I thought that judgment played any part in this problem. Oh, what does? Instinct and prayer. You pray your instincts are sound. Is that it? Yes, that's right. Except we don't exactly know what we mean by sound. We mean not obviously sick, at least. As to that, it's an amazing thing I've noticed. When someone's been sick, begins to get better, He's generally more balanced and has sounder instinct in many ways than people who've never been ill. Immunity. <laughs> Perhaps I never thought of it like that. But most likely it's insight and understanding and the knowledge that he's been there. He's been right down to the bottom of the barrel and no matter what happens to him, he can't be as bad off as he was once. It's a negative way of looking at it, perhaps, but... Well... Sometimes I wish that half the people in this city had been ill and were getting better. Coffee tonight? Yes. Thanks, Doctor. Come in, Jim. Milne gave me this yesterday. The proposed new setup. Your work, he said, and his. Uh, sit down, Jim. I do appreciate the way you took Roy in on this. It's a very remarkable piece of work, Jim. I tried to phone you about it last night. I was out, I'm sorry. At Ruth's, I believe. Yes. Mrs. Cartwright, at your number, said that's where you undoubtedly were. Now, I... I don't mean to pry, Jim. Ruth's had some pretty rough going. Then served you. There's something that I think perhaps I should have mentioned to you before. 
Some time ago, the police telephoned me to inquire your whereabouts on a certain day. I'm sorry. I didn't want them to bother you. Oh, nonsense. I don't want you ever to feel that way. Fact is, I hate to see a man followed up on like this. Jim, I go a great deal on feelings. And I had a feeling about you the first day you walked through that door. And the way you've tackled this work has more than borne me out. Now, to put this plan into operation needs a competence of its own. I shall want you to work close beside me as my personal assistant with a considerable amount of executive authority. You'd be willing, I take it? Yes. There's Milne, of course. Sooner or later, he's bound to know that you replaced him. And how does one explain to a man who's worked with you all these years? Hmm? Well, that's not your problem. Suppose you relax for a while, begin to think about the first steps that you want to take, and we'll have our talks later. Is that all right? Yes. Oh, and, and Jim, about the salary you started on here, you'll leave me to revise that, won't you? Thank you, Mr. Klein. With executive authority. I'm very impressed. This is bound to change things between us. Well, I can't be found drying dishes again, of course. Naturally not. Jim, we have to celebrate somehow. Hmm? Yes. Well, there's the carnival Saturday. That'll do for a start. I have an idea. You go with Janie, and I stay home and cook a special dinner. Mm. Oh, that'll never do. Jim, please. That's the way I'd like to celebrate. bother you, Jim. Mommy said he used to be a sailor. I said yes, but right now I wish I were ashore. Oh, no. <laughs> well, this is a lot better than pop going in the day. Yes. Only I wish I was ashore too. Jamie, not really. May I be excused? Oh, come I get you into bed. Good night, Jim. Good night, Jenny. And I can see you now. Not only the good points, but the weaknesses too. You have some, you know. I have. Yes, you're far too good and far too decent. But I'll put up with that. And I suddenly know this about myself too. That I'm not afraid of liking someone again. That I don't feel guilty about it. Much more than that, that I haven't been trying to settle for something only halfway right because of loneliness. I'm sorry, Jim. Why? Because you don't feel that way yet. Ruth. <laughs> the first thing you know, I make you say something you don't even mean. <laughs> Ruth, listen. I love you so very much. <laughs> you see? You know that. Not until I wrenched it out of you. Was it painful? No. <laughs> Mommy! Mommy! I'm coming, dear. Oh, what a time. Will you wait, Jim? No, I think you really ought to stay with her. It's getting late, Ruth. I'm sorry. Oh, oh please. Mommy, quick! 
I'm coming, dear. Yes, Ruth, goodbye. I'm sorry, Jim. Do you have a moment? Yes, of course, Roy, come in. I was with Andrew over the weekend. I suppose you know what I'm referring to. I think so. I knew something was going on when he asked me out to the house. It hasn't in quite a while, you know. I'm sorry, Roy. You're sorry. You're always so damn sorry. Why don't you say what you mean? Why don't you say you're so happy? You... I, I, I don't know what I'm saying. It needn't make all that difference. No. No, I suppose not. It's just not easy, you see. Anyway, there's a real future for you here, Jim. I wish you luck. I really mean that. Thank you, Roy. What's the matter? What is it, Gertrude? It's not true. No. Well, listen to me, Slater. The photograph on page one pictures James Fontaine, alias James Fuller, convicted of abduction of nine-year-old Patricia Ellsworth of London with yes, intent to commit rape, released after serving a sentence of three years. How this admitted sexual psychopath uses his freedom is illustrated in our photograph. It was taken in the carnival Saturday afternoon. He was in company of this child for more than an hour, buying her ice cream and taking her on some of the rides. One of these rides was a catapult device operating with particular violence, capable of shocking and frightening a young child, making her cling to the adult who accompanied her. Arnold. Fontaine has been questioned in the still unsolved rape murder of 11-year-old Lois Springer, Arnold. who was... Jim, I want to ask you a question. You said it isn't true. But that picture said... But three years ago... Of course you... it's true. Is this you, Fontaine, three years ago? Yes, well, look at it. Of course, it's true. Newspapers don't lie. That one does. They print trash. I've told you time and again not to bring it in here. I knew I'd seen him somewhere. This is what I saw. Jim, is Fontaine your real name? Oh, I keep asking him questions. He's the one. First that little girl in London and now probably Lois... Be quiet. Go into the kitchen. I want to talk to Jim. I won't leave you alone I here with... I said go into the kitchen. All right, mother. I'm not going to have him in my house another night. We're decent people. He can't come back under this roof after taking little girls and... Jim. You didn't escape from prison. They released me. I'm on parole. But how could they possibly... The doctors recommended it. They agreed I was well. Well? I was sick, Gertrude. I didn't understand what I was doing. But how could you do a thing like that? I'm trying to tell you. It said with intent to commit. Then you didn't really. No. But you actually did take that poor Gertrude. little child. Imagine the terror. How she may feel for the rest of her life. I dreamed of it, Gertrude, a thousand times. The nightmare I had, the night you came into my room. And this, this Mrs. Layton. How is she going to feel when she sees that Listen picture? Listen to me. That little girl in that picture is her daughter. I was just taking her for... Her daughter. Oh. Please leave this house. 
Pack your bag at once and get out. the reporter. I'd like to speak to Mr. Austin. Austin here. This is Jim Fuller. Ah. What do you want, Fontaine? You wrote that story about me, didn't you? Yes. Why? Well, I'm a newspaper man, Fontaine. That was a dirty, rotten thing to do. Well, I'm sorry you feel that way about it, but I didn't... Well, why did you do it? Look, I don't owe you any explanations, but I'll tell you. Since that night I met you at the police station, I've been interested in you. I wanted to do an honest story on you. Honest? I wanted to know how a sexual psychopath functions when they let him loose. When I saw you that day with Mrs. Layton, I wondered... How can a chap who likes little girls... Damn you! Uh, do you want me to hang up, Fontaine, or do you want to hear? Now, why should you want to know a woman like that? So I found out where she lived. I was around her house, weekends especially. And the first weekend that I was there, I knew what you were after. What do you mean? Oh, Fontaine. I knew that sooner or later... You'd be taking that little girl off alone. Listen to me, Austin. I'm going to sue you and your paper. Look, we have enough lawsuits pending to paper half of England, and I'll tell you something else. Very few of them collect. I'll collect. Will you? Now, look. You have a record of child seduction. You were called in on the Springer case. But last Saturday... You were with a Leighton girl, weren't you? Holding her hand, buying her ice creams, taking her for those... You lousy... Now, now, Fontaine, let's not act like a psychopath. If you wanted to stay out of the papers, you should have kept your nose clean. Stayed away from little girls. I didn't think you could, though. None of you can. Listen. Well, I'm listening, Fontaine. I want you to... You want me to what? I don't know. Room 23. Number, please. Give me Wellington 2184. Sorry, sir, there seems to be no reply. Let it ring. Somebody must be there. Sorry, sir. Shall I try again? Yes, try it again after a while. Yes? answer, sir. What time do you make it? 11.15. I'll keep on trying if you like. No, never mind. Good morning, 
Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Annette. I wasn't sure you'd be in. I saw no reason why not. I doubt let's beat about the bush, Jim. All right. I was phoned about it last evening. Actually, I didn't see the paper until this morning. I hate that filthy rag. It was Milne who called me. I don't mind telling you, I slept very little last night. I didn't do much better. It's barbaric the way they go after a man. They hound him, they hound him to death. I'm not quite dead yet. Uh, Jim, will you tell me something? How did it happen that you took Jane into that carnival? Any reason why I shouldn't? I didn't ask you that. Well, Ruth asked me to. She wanted to cook the dinner. We promised Janie we'd take her. I knew that was it. Mr. Clive, And said... the day the police telephoned me, that was the Springer case. Yes. You must have gone through agonies. Mr. Clive, you said we wouldn't beat about the bush. Now, I've become very fond of you, Jim. You know that. You're going to fire me, is that it? It sounds brutal, put that way. I guess because things are. That filthy rag, I... I never read it myself, but there are thousands of people who do. They mention that I worked here, of course. Yes. Now, if the basis of this organization wasn't essentially public relations... I understand perfectly. Do you really? Yes. You'd like me to go at once, I suppose. Jim, I'm in touch with organizations of many kinds all over the country. I should like to help you to make a fresh start. Will you let me? Thank you. And Jim, there's a check here for two months' pay. Actually, it's for work already done. Now, please, take it. If there's anything about the report you'd like to discuss? Not now, Jim. That won't be necessary. I see. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to wait here until Ruth comes in. You're not coming in today. She phoned me earlier. Oh. Goodbye, Mr. Clive. Goodbye, Jim. When I got home from the office just after six, the reporter started calling. Could I give them a statement? Could I tell them where you were? <laughs> they kept talking about the northern reporter. I hadn't even the slightest idea what they were talking about. It was Margaret who came over with it. Her husband had brought it home. They kept calling and calling, asking all kinds of intimate questions about you and Janie and me. And it was so terrible, I, I just decided not to answer. And by the time I realized that you weren't coming, that you might be phoning, I just couldn't. And Janie? I sent her over to Margaret's and had her stay the night over there. I just said I had to go back to the office. Jim, I don't understand. Why did the reporters call here? The story didn't mention Janie by name. Austin would have told him. A man we met at the pub? 
Must have been delighted to have the other papers follow up when he started. Jim, why didn't you come? I don't know. Oh, I'm tired, Ruth. You went to the office? I spoke to Clive. He told me. He was awfully upset. Did he tell you I was through? No. I am. It took courage to go there. It took more to come here. To me? I wanted to tell you, Ruth. I know that. Not just the other night, but long before. That is my fault. No, none of it. Now, in this rotten way. It doesn't matter, Jim. Doesn't matter. Ruth, what might have been possible, barely possible, but... And now, in this way, I... And what about Janie? Janie doesn't know. There's no reason why she ever should. Ruth, you and I alone, perhaps, but... Well, Margaret and her husband, what did they say? You can't even tell me. Margaret tried to understand. But he couldn't. There are children on these streets, and they must be protected. Jim! Well, it isn't ready yet, Janie. Why don't you go over to Margaret's and wait until Mommy calls you? Will you do that, Janie? Yes, Jim. Leave it, Jim. Hello. What time is it, 
too. Do you think it's stolen from me, Doctor? This is a hell of an hour in the morning to get literary. Sit down. How can you sleep with all this coffee you drink? A joke, son. Pretty funny, I think. Well, I must admit that I was worried about you, but I'm not now. I see you're one of my fans, too. Well, that. Well, the department told me about that. Seems that a reporter from one of the dailies phoned them. He's looking for an angle on you that they can use. He even suggested that they help him get an interview with you, that he'd see that his paper handled your case with sympathy and restraint. Sympathy and restraint. This, this funny man had the nerve to say that he thought it would be helpful if, you, if you'd make a statement pleading with the man who killed Lois Springer to give himself up. <laughs> you know, one, one sex criminal to another. Only, he said, we'd make it perfectly clear that you had reformed. Reformed. It's a good likeness, anyway. You cut that out. Now, is that Ruth's daughter? Mm -hmm. Now, what was going on between you two when this picture was taken? I was getting ready to assault her on the merry-go-round. All right, I'm sorry I asked for that, but you know what I mean. Well, I think it was taken right after she, she first told me she loved me. And I had realized for the first time what I felt for her. And what a beautiful thing that feeling was. Have you been waiting here all this time for me, Doctor? And what do you think? Well, Doctor, I... Because it's not in a glass, it's good whiskey, drink it. Another. That's enough. You may get to like this stuff. Better? Yes. Did you eat anything today? No, I'm not hungry. Well, I'm a fool. I'm a sick fool. Sorry to disappoint you, but you neither. I haven't cried like this since since those first days in prison. After the way people probably treated you today, well. Oh, I called Clive. He's a human rat. No, he's not. Oh, but don't you defend him. He's a mealy mouthed, gutless piece of human he being. He had to do what he did, don't you see? No, I don't see. And when are you going to start fighting back? It's easy enough for you to say, Doctor. I suppose it is. Oh, Jimmy, why didn't you come earlier? Why didn't you come this morning or last night? I don't know. Most of the time, I, I had just been running around in circles, trying to get away from people. Pretty hard. Hmm, yes. You seem to be everywhere. It's one of the horrors of our modern cities. Have you got a cigarette? My usual brand. The way you feel, I suppose you can smoke even these. Doctor, I made up my mind. Want to go back to prison or to some hospital? Why? You know why. No, I don't. Tell me. Let's not play one of those psychotherapy games on me. Not tonight. You tell me why you want to go back. Because I'm sick. Because I'm not fit to live around people. You mean that people are afraid to have you living around them? What's the difference? There's quite a bit of difference. Believe me, if I thought there was the slightest danger of you being sick again... There I... is. Jimmy, you're upset and you have every right to be, but you... Doctor, I want to go back. This girl, Ruth, what happened with her? I see. Are you going to send me back? No. What do I have to do? Do I have to run amok? You couldn't run amok if you wanted to. Doctor, please. Yes. James, people have strange ideas about mental illness. They haven't educated themselves out of the Middle Ages yet. Doctor, do you want me to educate them? Do you want me to go through all kinds of hell so that you can rub your hands together and say you're making some kind of progress? Sit down, Jim. Eh? 
Well, you're right. I am treating you as a statistic instead of a friend. Friend? Yes, a friend. Not an inmate, not a patient, not a parolee, but a friend. And not, not a man that you drink a glass of beer with and he slaps you on the back, perhaps. But I have a feeling if I were in trouble, real trouble, you'd break your neck to help me. Well, wouldn't you? You know I would. Thanks. But you're in trouble now, Jim, and it's not your fault, and that's what makes it harder. That's why I have to talk to you straight. Now, when I'm finished, if you like, I'll see to it that you're admitted to a mental institution. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, first, you know that you can lead a normal life now, don't you? I mean, Ruth proved that Ruth and her daughter, or rather, you proved it yourself with their help. I don't want to talk about them. You proved it once, you can do it again. But if you want to live that life, you have to start now, because if you go into an institution, you'll give up, slowly but surely. Instead, I'm to go around posing for newspaper pictures. Is that... Now, you stop that. If you want to feel sorry for yourself, I'm not your man. James, don't you understand? It was the wildest kind of accident that that vulture from the newspaper caught up with you. It could happen again. Sure, it could happen again, and you could get hit by a car, and you could drown in a bathtub, but the chances are enormously against it. I'm tired, Doctor. Oh, Jimmy, Jimmy, you can start again right here, if you like. Or maybe in another city, the department could arrange. And sit on a powder keg and wait for the next blow-up, huh? That's a chance you'll have to take. Because it's either that or slow deterioration in some mental ward. I don't, I don't know. I do. I do, Jimmy. There's one more thing, finally. Something you know pretty well by now. I can help you, but I can't solve your problems for you. It's up to you. How about it, Jim? I guess you win, Doctor. You've got that a little twisted, my friend. What you mean is, you win. Hello, Jim. Hello, Ruth. Will you come in? I'm sorry to surprise you like this. It's all right. I was afraid if I wrote. I was sure I would find you here on Saturday, I thought. Can I get you something? No, thank you. Well, you've had a long trip. I got an early start. It's not too long. It's a nice flat. Well, it's not a rooming house, which is what I like about it. Nobody bothers you. Usually, you mean. How did you know where I lived? Dr. McNally. Clive told you about him? Yes. I've seen him several times. McNally? How's your job here, Jim? It's all right. Clive was a big help. I suppose you know about that. I knew you wouldn't want me to come. It was nice of you. Do you think that's why I came? Please, Ruth. I don't blame you. 
Ruth, whatever the reason, don't... Please don't feel sorry. Just try to forget it. Do you think I ever can? I or Janie, for that matter. She asked about you, by the way. She asked about you all the time. I'm sorry, Jim, I don't mean to cry. All the way down here, I... I uh, said to myself, no matter what happens, I mustn't. Please, Ruth. Jim, I did that for weeks after you'd left. Oh, all my life, I thought I was so intelligent. Well, you couldn't help what you did. Dr. McNally tried to make me understand that. At first, I didn't want to discuss Janie with him. I, I was too ashamed. I... I just wanted to forget. <coughs> All I wanted to ask him was to reassure me, to convince me that there was no chance of anything. He refused. I was furious at him. All he would say is that you're well. Then he made me talk about Janie. Made me tell him what happened. Made me admit. <sighs> he can be cruel. He wouldn't think that at first. I guess you know that better than I. In the end, he told me that it was my problem and that he couldn't solve it for me. Jim, do you still want me? More than anything in the world. You know that. Yes, but would you hold me and tell me that? what it would be like being with me. I have. Any minute, somebody's memory is like... Lacan. As long as we are together. And Janie? I don't know, Jim. I have to be honest. It'll take time. Maybe a long time. I would be lying if I said it wouldn't. Yes. Anyway, there is time now. Lots of time. 